The screams of Captain George Jones's crew echoed through the corridor as Akamarian Marines executed them one by one, ignoring the humans' desperate pleas for mercy. The Akamarian warships had torn George's vessel out of hyperspace without warning, boarding it and slaughtering everyone on board except the captain himself. George, forced to watch helplessly as his friends and crewmates were murdered in cold blood, struggled against the Akamarian guards, pinning his arms behind his back. The alien marines laughed at his efforts, dragging him through the blood-stained corridors of what was left of his ship. By order of Emperor Korvac, ruler of the Akamarian Galactic Empire, you are under arrest for violating Akamarian trade laws, one of the marines growled at George. Your crew paid the price for your species' insolence. Now you will answer to the emperor himself. The Akamarians, a ruthless empire spanning a quarter of the Milky Way, saw themselves as the supreme power of the galaxy. They viewed humanity and other younger races as primitive upstarts needing to be put in their place. Boarding and slaughtering the crew of an Earth trading vessel on false charges was just another way to flex their strength and teach the humans a lesson. George, bruised and shackled, was brought before Emperor Korvac himself on the Akamarian throne world. The Emperor, seated on his ornate throne and flanked by his elite guards, looked down at the human captain with undisguised contempt. Let this unprovoked attack serve as a warning to your kind, Korvac said imperiously. Humanity is nothing compared to the might of the Akamarian Galactic Empire. We can crush you like insects beneath our heel. Be grateful we let your pathetic species live, for now. George was sentenced to a life of hard labor in the hellish Akamarian crystal mines, never to see Earth again. But when news of the brutal attack and the cold-blooded murders reached humanity's homeworld, the people of Earth reacted with horror and outrage. This was an act of war, a direct assault on humanity itself. The Akamarian Empire may be large and powerful, but Earth could not let such an atrocity go unanswered. The unprovoked killing of innocent humans would be avenged no matter the cost. The President of Earth addressed the world, her voice hard as steel. This attack on our people will not stand. The Akamarian Empire must pay for what they've done. Humanity is going to war. Earth's world government voted unanimously to approve a military response. Across the planet, recruiting stations were flooded with millions of volunteers eager to join the fight against the Akamarians. If the Emperor wanted a war, he would get one. Humanity would not go quietly. A final warning was transmitted into Akamarian space on all frequencies. Attention, Akamarian Empire. You killed our people. You threatened our very existence. You think us weak and primitive. But you have made a grave mistake. For your crimes, you will pay the ultimate price. We are coming for you now. Your worlds will burn. Your armies will be crushed. You wanted a war. And now you will see what it means to fight humankind. Humanity will have justice. Accompanying the broadcast was footage of Earth's mighty war fleet being assembled. Thousands of dreadnoughts, battleships, and carriers, armed to the teeth with the most devastating weapons humanity could muster. A sword honed to a razor's edge, aimed directly at the heart of the Akamarian Empire. Emperor Korvac received the transmission and laughed. He dismissed humanity's warning as a bluff, the posturing of a species too weak to be any real threat. After all, what could one primitive world do against the might of his galactic empire? He would enjoy teaching the humans their place once and for all. But Korvac had badly underestimated his enemy. He didn't realize that he had just awakened a slumbering giant. The humans were coming for the Akamarians in force, and they would not stop until the Empire was a smoking ruin. The Emperor's arrogance was about to cost his people dearly. The Terran fleet set course for Akamarian space, weapons primed and ready for war. The battle for the galaxy was about to begin, and the Akamarians would soon learn to fear humankind's wrath. No matter how long it took, humanity would have its revenge. Earth's mighty war fleet surged into Akamarian space like an unstoppable tidal wave of vengeance. Thousands of ships filled with the most destructive weapons humanity had ever created fell upon the unsuspecting enemy with a fury that shook the galaxy. 
Admiral Jack Anderson stood on the bridge of his flagship, the T.S. Retribution, his eyes hard as he watched the Akamarian defenses crumble before him. His ships were things of terrible beauty, sleek predators armed with advanced energy weapons and guided by powerful AI combat systems. Against this onslaught, the Akamarians stood little chance. In the span of a few days, Admiral Anderson's fleet rained destruction upon over a dozen major Akamarian bases and shipyards. Hundreds of enemy warships were torn apart by searing beams of plasma and vaporized by salvos of antimatter missiles. The Akamarians fought back desperately, but their defenses were overwhelmed by the relentless precision of the human attacks. On the conquered human colony of New Jakarta, Akamarian soldiers ran in panicked retreat as human marines and colonial militia stormed their garrison. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Akamarians were swiftly driven from the planet, forced to abandon their occupation in the face of the vengeful human forces. Across the Akamarian frontier, human strike teams launched daring raids deep behind enemy lines. They hit supply depots, communications hubs, and power stations, crippling the Akamarian war machine. Elite human commandos infiltrated Akamarian prison camps, liberating POWs and bringing them back to the safety of human-controlled space. Emperor Korvac, enraged by the stunning defeats inflicted by the humans, pounded his fist against the arm of his throne. He had gravely miscalculated, underestimating the capabilities and sheer bloodthirsty perseverance of this upstart species. Korvac lashed out, ordering the execution of human prisoners in a fit of petty vengeance. In the hellish Akamarian crystal mines, George Jones and his fellow captives were dragged before a firing squad. But just as the Akamarian soldiers raised their weapons to execute the humans, George and the other prisoners launched a desperate uprising. They leapt at their guards, wrestling away their guns and turning them on their captors. In the chaos, George and a handful of others managed to fight their way to a shuttle bay and commandeer a small craft. Blasting their way out of the mines, they fled into space, vanishing among the stars as they made for human territory. Beaten, but not broken, the Akamarian military regrouped, rallying their reserves for a series of vicious counterattacks to blunt the human advance. Massive fleet battles erupted as Akamarian warships clashed with Admiral Anderson's armada, in a tempest of destruction. Scorched hulks and debris fields littered the void as both sides traded furious blows. The humans grimly pushed forward, accepting their own losses as they systematically dismantled the Akamarian fleet. Yet more human-occupied worlds were liberated from Akamarian control, their populations rising up to join the fight. On the Akamarian throne world, Emperor Korvac seethed with rage as reports of human victories continued to flood in. In desperation, he authorized the use of forbidden planet-killer weapons, doomsday devices that could wipe entire human colonies from existence. When human intelligence learned of the Akamarian plan, Admiral Anderson reacted immediately. He personally led a commando strike team in a covert assault on the planet-killer construction facility. Infiltrating through the installation's defenses, the human operatives sabotaged the Akamarian failsafes and overloaded the containment fields. The planet killers detonated in a cataclysmic explosion, vaporizing the facility, the research staff, and the weapons themselves. Korvac's terrible gambit had been foiled, but at a heavy cost. The course of the war increasingly turned against the Akamarians as human forces drove ever deeper into their territory. Earth's soldiers and ships demonstrated a prowess and adaptability far beyond anything the Akamarians had anticipated. Inspiring stories of human triumphs and Akamarian brutality spread across the galaxy, prompting many other races to rally to Earth's cause. Fleets and armies from a dozen species threw their support behind humanity, determined to aid them in casting down the hated Akamarian Empire. What had begun as a war of retribution for one heinous act was swiftly becoming a galactic crusade to overthrow a reviled regime. George Jones gripped the controls of the stolen Akamarian shuttle, his fingers tightening with tension. The battered craft limped through space, its engines sputtering and hull creaking. Behind him, the other escaped prisoners huddled in silence, their eyes haunted by the horrors they'd endured. 
We're almost there, George said, his voice hoarse. Just hang on a little longer. As they approached the edge of human-controlled space, alarms blared. A massive shape loomed before them, a human patrol ship. George's heart raced as he opened a comm channel. This is Captain George Jones, former prisoner of the Akamarians. We request immediate pickup and asylum. The response was swift. Captain Jones? By God, we thought you were dead. Stand by for tractor beam. Hours later, George stood before Admiral Anderson on the bridge of the TES retribution. He recounted everything. The prison camps, the defenses, the secret installations he'd glimpsed during his escape. Anderson's eyes gleamed. This is exactly what we needed. With this intel, we can hit them where it hurts. The Admiral outlined his bold plan to the assembled officers. A massive fleet would engage the Akamarian home defenses while strike teams infiltrated their throne world. George listened in awe as Anderson detailed the daring assault. Jones, I want you leading one of those teams, Anderson said. You've seen their defenses firsthand. Think you're up for it? George nodded grimly. I've got a score to settle with Emperor Korvac. The battle for Corvassia Prime erupted in a maelstrom of fire and destruction. Human dreadnoughts traded devastating broadsides with Akamarian battlecruisers. Fighters swarmed like angry hornets, their energy weapons carving glowing trails through the void. On the bridge of the Retribution, Anderson barked orders as his fleet pushed through the enemy's defensive line. Alarms wailed as a spread of Akamarian torpedoes slammed into their shields. Breach in Sector 7, an officer called out. Sealing emergency bulkheads. Anderson gritted his teeth. Press the attack! We need to punch through before they can regroup. Meanwhile, cloaked human dropships slipped past the Akamarian defenses. George's strike team touched down outside the sprawling Imperial Palace. They moved swiftly through the manicured grounds, cutting down surprised guards with precision fire. Remember, we're here for Korvac, George said as they breached the main entrance. Watch for traps and stay alert. They fought their way through gilded halls and opulent chambers. Akamarian royal guards fell before their relentless advance. George's team suffered casualties, but pressed on with fierce dedication. Finally, they reached the massive doors of the throne room. George planted breaching charges and signaled his team to take cover. The explosion rocked the palace and they stormed in through the smoke and debris. Emperor Korvac stood before his throne, energy sword crackling in his grip. His eyes locked onto George with hateful recognition. You, Korvac snarled. I should have executed you myself, human filth. George raised his weapon. It's over, Korvac. Surrender now. With an enraged roar, the Emperor charged. George dove aside, narrowly avoiding the humming blade. They clashed in a furious duel, Korvac's skill matched by George's burning desire for justice. George fainted left, then dropped low and swept Korvac's legs. The Emperor crashed to the floor, his sword skittering away. Before he could recover, George had him pinned, a blade at his throat. Not so mighty now, are you? George growled. Across the planet, other human teams seized key targets. The Central Military Command fell, its Akamarian officers caught completely off guard. Power grids and communication hubs were sabotaged, throwing enemy forces into disarray. As word spread of Korvac's capture, Akamarian resistance crumbled. But even as victory seemed assured, a new threat emerged. Fanatic death cultists seized control of ancient superweapons, targeting both human and Akamarian worlds in a mad bid for mutual destruction. Admiral Anderson's voice crackled over the comms. All teams, we have a priority Omega situation. Death cultists are activating doomsday weapons. Stop them at all costs. An elite human spec ops unit tracked the cultists to a decrepit space station. They launched a desperate zero-G assault, battling through the station's winding corridors. We're running out of time! The team leader shouted as they fought their way to the control room. If those weapons launch, billions die. With seconds to spare, they reached the main console. A furious firefight erupted as the cultists made their last stand. 
the human operators worked feverishly to abort the launch sequence while their comrades held off waves of attackers. A deafening klaxon sounded as the weapons began powering up. The lead operator's fingers flew across the controls, overriding fail-safes and disabling activation protocols. Got it, he yelled as the klaxon cut off. Weapons neutralized! But it was a bittersweet victory. Though total apocalypse was averted, the cultists had managed to fire off several payloads. Reports flooded in of devastation on multiple colony worlds, both human and Akamarian. With their leadership captured and their military in tatters, the majority of Akamarian forces laid down their arms. Pockets of die-hard resistance remained, but the war that had begun with such brutality was effectively over. Humanity and its allies stood triumphant over the once mighty Akamarian Empire. The once mighty Akamarian Empire lay in ruins, its worlds under human occupation. Emperor Korvac sat in a stark detention cell, awaiting trial for his crimes. The imperial palace that once echoed with his decrees now housed Earth Military Command. General Voss of the Akamarian military signed the unconditional surrender with a trembling hand. It is done, he muttered, pushing the document across the table. Admiral Anderson nodded grimly. Your cooperation will ensure a smooth transition. But even as the ink dried, reports flooded in of attacks across occupied space. A human supply convoy erupted in flames as blood claw suicide bombers struck. On New Jakarta, colonists fled screaming as militants stormed the streets. Anderson thumped his hand on the war room table. These fanatics won't accept defeat. We need to root them out. He dispatched strike teams to known blood claw strongholds. George Jones led an assault on a hidden base, his team breaching the defenses in a hail of gunfire. They cleared room after room but found only abandoned equipment and cold rations. Damn it, they slipped away again, George growled, kicking a crate in frustration. The attacks continued. A residential tower on Proxima II collapsed as a blood claw operative detonated a matter-antimatter bomb. Thousands of civilians, human and Akamarian alike, perished in the blast. Then came the ultimate escalation. A priority alert blared across all channels as Blood Claw forces seized control of the Sunbreaker weapons platform. This is Blood Claw Command, a harsh voice transmitted. Release our brothers or watch as we turn your worlds to ash. Earth's Security Council convened an emergency session. Voices raised in heated debate as they weighed their options. We don't negotiate with terrorists, insisted the UN Secretary. Anderson turned to George. You know that station's layout. Think you can retake it? George nodded grimly. We'll get it done, sir. His strike team's stealth shuttle slipped past the platform's outer defenses. They cut through the hull, engaging in furious close-quarters combat. Bloodclaw zealots fought with suicidal dedication, and George lost good men with each compartment they cleared. Finally, they reached the control center. The Blood Claw leader, a scarred Akamarian veteran, stood at the main console. It ends here, human, he snarled, lunging at George. They grappled in the zero-G environment, trading vicious blows. George felt ribs crack as his opponent slammed him into a bulkhead. But with a desperate surge, he managed to wrap his arms around the Akamarian's neck, twisting until he heard a snap. As the terrorist leader's lifeless body drifted away, George's second-in-command disabled the firing sequence. Payload neutralized, sir. We did it. George allowed himself a moment of relief before keying his comm. Platform secure, Admiral. Threat eliminated. But even as they were hailed as heroes, the victory felt hollow. Reports of fresh blood claw attacks poured in daily. Human soldiers patrolling Akamarian streets cast wary glances at every shadow. On Earth, protests erupted outside government buildings. Bring our troops home, the crowds chanted. In a closed-door meeting, heated voices argued over the path forward. We can't abandon the Akamarians to chaos, insisted one general. We need to finish what we started. A diplomat countered, the cost in lives and resources is unsustainable. We should begin a phased withdrawal. As the debate raged on, George Jones stood at the viewport of an orbiting station, gazing down at the war-torn Akamarian homeworld. 
he couldn't shake the feeling that their hardest battles still lay ahead. George's foreboding sense that their hardest battles lay ahead proved prophetic. On Earth, the tide of public opinion turned swiftly against the occupation. Protests erupted outside government buildings, their chants growing louder and angrier each day. Bring our troops home! The crowd's fury reverberated through the streets of Washington, D.C. Signs waved in the air, displaying gruesome images of human casualties. No more blood for Akamarian oil! Inside the Pentagon, Admiral Anderson paced before a wall of screens displaying the chaos unfolding across occupied Akamarian space. His uniform was rumpled, dark circles under his eyes betraying his exhaustion. We can't abandon them now, he pleaded to the assembled Joint Chiefs. If we pull out, everything we fought for will be lost. General Hawkins banged his hand on the table. And how many more body bags are you willing to send home, Anderson? The blood claws are bleeding us dry. On the Akamarian capital world of Corvacia Prime, Lieutenant Sarah Chen crouched behind a crumbling wall, her rifle clutched tightly to her chest. The acrid stench of burning plastics filled her nostrils as she peered around the corner, scanning for movement. A child's cry pierced the air. Sarah tensed, her finger hovering over the trigger. Was it a trap or an innocent caught in the crossfire? Potential hostile, two o'clock, her squad mate whispered. Should we engage? Sarah hesitated, torn between protocol and conscience. In that moment of indecision, a hidden blood claw sniper opened fire. Sarah felt the searing pain of a plasma round tearing through her shoulder. As medics rushed to evacuate her, Sarah caught glimpses of the devastation around her. Once gleaming towers reduced to rubble, Akamarian civilians fleeing in terror, their eyes filled with hate for their supposed liberators. The final straw came without warning. On a quiet Tuesday morning, alarms blared across a dozen human outposts. Blood claw suicide squads struck with synchronized precision, detonating dirty bombs and unleashing lethal nerve agents. Inside the new Jakarta colony hub, panicked civilians clawed at sealed airlock doors as toxic gas seeped through the ventilation system. Children collapsed, foaming at the mouth. The lucky ones died quickly. As casualty reports flooded in, Earth's purpose crumbled. Within hours, the UN Security Council convened an emergency session. The vote was nearly unanimous. We hereby order the complete withdrawal of all Earth forces from Akamarian space, the Secretary General announced, his voice heavy with defeat, to be completed within six months. George Jones watched the news broadcast with clenched fists, fury building inside him. All those lives lost, all that sacrifice, for nothing. His comlink chirped. It was a priority message from his wife, Sarah, who was overseeing civilian evacuations. George's heart raced as he answered. George, we're under attack. Sarah's voice was barely audible over the sound of explosions. They've breached the... The signal cut out abruptly. George tried desperately to reestablish contact, but there was only static. Hours later, the grim news arrived. Sarah's transport had been destroyed by a blood claw suicide bomber. There were no survivors. George's world shattered. Grief gave way to a cold, consuming rage. He gathered a group of like-minded special operators, men and women who had lost everything and had nothing left to lose. Anderson's withdrawal plan is a death sentence, George growled, addressing his makeshift strike team. If we're going out, we're taking those bastards with us. They commandeered a stealth dropship, plotting a course for Akamar's third moon, a desolate, irradiated wasteland. Deep beneath its pockmarked surface lay the Blood Claw's secret headquarters. As they breached the outer defenses, alarms blared. Fanatic defenders poured from hidden passages, their faces twisted with hate. For Earth! George roared, leading the charge into the labyrinthine complex. The air filled with plasma fire and the screams of the dying. Inch by bloody inch they fought their way towards the central chamber. George's team dwindled, each fallen comrade fueling his rage. Finally, they reached the inner sanctum. The doors blew open revealing the supreme blood claw leader, 
a scarred Akamarian warlord whose name was whispered in terror across a dozen worlds. You're too late, human, the leader sneered. Your weakness dooms you. George said nothing. He lunged forward, combat knife flashing. They grappled in a brutal dance of death, neither willing to yield. Pain exploded in George's side as the Akamarian's blade found its mark. But even as his life ebbed away, George drove his own knife home. The two mortal enemies collapsed, their blood mingling on the cold metal floor. George's vision dimmed, the sounds of battle fading away. As consciousness slipped from his grasp, he saw Admiral Anderson kneeling beside him. George struggled to form his final words. We became what we hated he gasped. Find a better way. Anderson clasped George's hand as the light faded from his eyes. Around them, the remaining blood claw forces were surrendering or fleeing. But victory, if it could be called that, rang hollow. As human ships prepared for their final departure from Akamarian space, the true cost of their crusade became clear. Millions dead on both sides. Worlds left scarred and broken. And for what? The once mighty fleets of Earth limped home, bearing the weight of their Pyrrhic triumph. They had achieved their original goal of justice, but at a terrible price. As they gazed upon the blue marble of their homeworld, each survivor carried the same unspoken question. What monsters had they become in their quest to slay a monster? You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.